I've been asked to talk about how to manage osteomyelitis of the hand and wrist. Um, I have a consulting agreement with Acumed and Arthrex. I'm not necessarily convinced of their relevance to uh, this particular presentation. So why is bone infection important? Well, uh, you see a huge spectrum of presentation. You can have uh, acute fracture related infections all the way through to very chronic indolent infections that patients have lived with for long periods of time that intermittently discharge. I think regardless of where you are in the world, there are significant cost implications associated with bone infection and it can be really tricky to, to treat. And then there's this risk of uh, potential sequelae. And before we move on to talk about sequelae, I think what we should probably talk about is what it's like to live with a bone infection. So this was a, a piece of work that was done by the Bone Infection Unit in Oxford. And they gave quality of life questionnaires to all of their patients who were coming through in clinic. And what you can see from these quality of life questionnaires is that patients living with bone infection have a worse quality of life than those patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, who've had a stroke, who have complications associated with diabetes. So it's really important for us to treat these patients expediently and as well as we can. So how do we diagnose bone infection? Well, the clinical signs are variable. We have these local clinical signs that Jonathan's talked about. We've got redness, we've got swelling, and then the systemic side effects as well. We see patients who are unwell. From a diagnostic perspective, blood tests are really of little value. Yes, you should get all of your routine screens to make sure that there's no other background issues with the patient but using CRPs and ESRs to determine whether you should operate on patients can be tricky. Both of these uh, numbers can lag behind clinical features and it's much better to use your clinical acumen. If you think somebody needs to go to an operating theatre, then take them to an operating theatre. We'd always get radiographs and for the first two to three days, the plain x-rays can be unremarkable. At about a week after the start of the infection, you can start to see osteopenia, bone destruction, little breaches within the cortices and some periosteal reaction. At about 10 to 14 days, you can start to see sequestra forming, and often you can see some generalized osteopenia due to the disuse of the bone. It's certainly a matter classified osteomyelitis, and it's a great classification system because it was a combined effect from a surgeon and a micropologist. So we see this dual approach to osteomyelitis. You see the anatomical approach, the type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4. And then we see the micropologist's perspective, the normal physiology of the host running all the way through to the patients who are so unwell that having the treatment is probably going to do them more harm than living with the disease. So this is a really important way of classifying not just what's going on with the bone, but what's going on with the rest of the patients. Jonathan touched on Carnarvon. And when it comes to managing infections of the hand and wrist, we really stand on the shoulders of the giants. And the book that he wrote in the early 20th century, this was written before penicillin had been discovered. It was 20 years before penicillin had actually been used on a human being. And we must remember that this was at a time pre-antibiotic therapy when patients died from their hand infections. So for people treating infections of the hand reasonably frequently, this is a great book to read. It takes you through all the principles of how to execute operations safely and well and how to rehabilitate the patients. When we see a patient in front of us, we kind of want to know what their occupation is. What do they need to achieve with their hands? We need to think about the host factors so that we can accurately um, classify these patients. Do they have diabetes? Do they smoke? Are they immunosuppressed from uh, other medical illnesses? And then we need to think about how they've potentially developed a bone infection. Have they been bitten by an animal? What kind of environment did the incident occur in? And only then do we start to think about the investigations that I've discussed. Timing of intervention is key. If you have somebody who's unwell, they need to go to theatre quickly. 
But sometimes if you have a patient who's not unwell, a thorough debridement by a patient by a surgeon who is awake is often better. And as Jonathan touched on, the first debridement is the best debridement. And it's at this point where you should start to be thinking about how to plan your treatment well. And what we often find at the bottom of an operating note is that the surgeon puts second look in second day in two days. And then you'll find that the patient will go back to theatre and they'll have another little wash and another little debridement and they'll get a third look in four days. And then they'll go back another two days later and they'll have a fourth look in six days. This isn't great. It's not great for the patient. It elongates their treatment pathway. And all it does is try to divert the problem to a different surgeon. The first debridement is the best debridement. And in your first debridement, you should be looking to eradicate all of the dead and infected tissue. And at the first debridement, you should be looking to plan your definitive treatment. Now, that may not be able to be executed two days later, but the surgeon undertaking the first debridement is the person in the best position to work out a pathway for this patient. So when we talk about doing a first debridement well, what do we really mean? Well, we want to remove all infected, dead, non-viable tissue. So the x-ray here is of a gentleman who had a fight bite and sustained a fracture to his middle metacarpal. It was fixed beautifully by one of my colleagues. Um, he was thoroughly washed out and unfortunately came back at two weeks with a hand that had become red and inflamed and painful. And I'd like to draw your attention to the small piece of bone that we've highlighted here in red. When I took him back to theatre, it was obvious that this piece of bone was dead and it needed to come out. So we were able to keep the rest of the fixation. We removed this piece of bone, gave everything a really good wash and a clean, and we filled that little area up with some antibiotic um, bone filler. We gave him a robust course of antibiotics for six weeks, and he was then able to have the metal work taken out once he'd reached union. So it's important that we take out everything that's not viable. What we want to do is we want to be in a position to accurately treat patients with antibiotics. And in order to do that, we have to sample these patients really well. So from the periprosthetic joint infection literature, we can see that you need five or six samples to be able to generate good enough specificities and sensitivities to enable you to identify the bacteria, which enables you to accurately find an antibiotic that will work. I completely accept if you're doing a paronychia, you're not going to get six samples out. In that context, it's much more important to take quality samples. So take the tissue that looks most infected. When we're sampling in Oxford, we have sampling trays. So we use new instruments each time we want to take a sample of deep tissue. And this is so that we've got fresh instruments. We're less likely to get contaminants on those instruments and on the tissue. So we're able to deliver tissue that hasn't been contaminated and we will get very good microbiological results. Something that I think is often potentially not looked on as much as some of the other aspects of the deprivement is managing the dead space. Probably one of the first operations that we've all done as surgeons is to drain an abscess. And when everybody drains an abscess, they pack the cavity because it's drilled into us that we must fill the, fill the dead space up and not allow that collection to recur. And it's important in the context of hand infection and also in the context of osteomyelitis. So this is a gentleman who had a, a scaphoid non-union uh, fixed with K wires. And what I'd like to illustrate is the two different ways that I, I'll manage dead space in these patients. So we've got two areas of his anatomy that we need to think about. The blue area is the scaphoid, and that's dead, so that has to come out. And then the red area is where the bone graft was taken from. So I want to manage both of these cavities, but I'll do it slightly differently. The scaphoid because there's a gap, 
And because I don't want the carpus to move, I filled up with um, arthroplasty cement. And that allows the carpus to remain out to length. And when I go back to do definitive surgery, it means I'm not looking at anatomy that's been altered. Because there's a cavity in the radius, I'll fill that up with antibiotic eluting bone filler that enables me to manage the dead space, but also to deliver antibiotic locally. And this is an example of um, what we use. It's called Ceremint. It's a bit like toothpaste, um, and you can get it in two flavors, one with gentamicin and one with vancomycin. You can see that on the picture on the right, that's the arthroplasty cement in the cavity where the scaphe woods come from. And on the left is um, me putting the antibiotic eluting filler in. And uh, as you can see, it resembles toothpaste. So once we've managed the dead space, we then need to think about how we're going to cover the soft tissues. It's important that we gain soft tissue cover as early as possible, and that enables us with a covered wound to treat patients more effectively. Only then do we start to think about how we're going to stabilize the skeleton. It is really important. Stable skeleton enables blood supply and immune cells to get to the uh, area of importance and it enables the patient to rehabilitate more quickly. And only then do we talk about appropriate antibiotic use. It's very, very important that we use antibiotics wisely. We're entering an era of antibiotic resistance. And if we do get an outbreak of a bacteria that is resistant to multiple um, antibiotics, then we could find ourselves in trouble. When it comes to osteomyelitis, this reasonably recent paper um, looking at whether oral or intravenous antibiotics can be used for bone infection is interesting. It demonstrated non-superiority of um, intravenous antibiotics to oral antibiotics. The key take-home pieces from the paper are that antibiotic adherence was much better in the oral group and the side effect profile and complication profile in the oral group was much, much lower. So whilst there was non-superiority between the two groups, the oral patients had fewer complications. We're currently recruiting into a different trial looking at whether short or long regimes of antibiotics are sufficient for osteomyelitis. And I think within the hand and the wrist for certain types of osteomyelitis, we can probably use shorter periods of antibiotic, but this data is yet to come out and be published. So once we've ensured that we've fulfilled all of our principles of treatment, we hopefully will be successful. But the key thing, the key thing to remember is that osteomyelitis is a surgical problem. This isn't something that you can fall back onto antibiotics to treat for you. You have to debride this well. And if you debride it well, you're much more likely to get positive treatment outcomes. Despite saying it's a surgical problem, it's definitely a team game. And I wouldn't be able to deliver the care that I deliver without a robust team of physiotherapists, microbiologists, infectious diseases physicians around me to help. I'll take you through our series briefly. Um, we've done a retrospective chart review of our patients over six years. Um, we've recorded various um, demographics and their treatment profiles. And whilst I was initiating my practice, I felt it was important that we were able to demonstrate that the antibiotic eluting bone filler that we were using was safe in the hand and wrist because there was very little literature about that, but also whether we'd be able to treat patients with shorter courses of antibiotics. So my two questions were, can we convert patients to oral antibiotics safely? And with antibiotic eluting bone filler, was it safe to use in the hand and the wrist? So we had quite a wide heterogeneous uh, group of patients as you'd expect. Um, about half the patients either had phalangeal problems or carpal and distal radius problems. And about seven patients had issues with the metacarpals. Interestingly, all the patients with metacarpal problems had previously had metalwork in situ. 
when we looked at the Cernia Madis staging for these patients, we found what you would see in the other parts of the literature in that the majority of patients were type B hosts, and the majority of patients had a mix of cortical and medullary disease. As you'd expect, the majority of our patients had Staphylococcus aureus. We did have some interesting organisms, um, and we saw a slightly higher rate of polymicrobial disease than we would expect. I think this is partly because we had a reasonable amount of patients who had metalwork in situ. And we know that when treating osteomyelitis that's previously had metalwork, you tend to see a higher than average polymicrobial mix. We were able to treat patients well with oral antibiotics. You can see the vast majority of these um, antibiotics are delivered orally. Um, we like to use um, medications like clindamycin because they've got very good bone penetration. Um, and this is why we have microbiologists to help us to decide what antibiotic to use. 26 of our 34 patients had metal wear in situ, and we have follow up out to five years in some patients. Uh, we've only needed to use uh, one free fibula. Uh, we've had one more since uh, this was uh, looked at, but we were able to eradicate osteomyelitis in all of our patients. 31 of our patients had ceramide used. In the literature, um, one of the complications associated with ceramide is wound ooze. And you see this, uh, this quite fluid, uh, creamy colored ooze coming out. It, it happens earlier than you would expect if it was pus, and it's a bit more, a bit less viscous than pus. And really it's gentamicin impregnated fluid. So whilst it can happen, it's not anything that we worry about. I think a key thing to prevent it and to manage it is to make sure there's a robust soft tissue cover before you close the skin. 30 out of 34 of the patients were treated definitively with oral antibiotics. And you can see that we had an average duration of four weeks, and that was tainted by one gentleman who had to have a prolonged course. So in summary, from our group, culture-driven oral antibiotics reliably treat bone infection of the hand and wrist. And this benefits the patient in that they can have reduced hospital stays, reduced complication profiles, and don't need pick lines. We also demonstrated that locally delivered antibiotic is safe and likely contributes to the fact that we can use oral antibiotics in these patients. That said, there's still no substitute for a thorough and well-executed debridement. Um, well, I've got a couple of cases that we can use as um, illustrations of, of how to treat patients. And then hopefully this will give us a framework from which we can work the cases that we're going to discuss later. Um, so this is the gentleman who we've, we've already looked at. So he's a 29 year old man who has a vascularized bone graft into his scaphoid fixed with wires that are left out of his skin. And he presents back at eight weeks post-surgery with what was termed a pin site infection. And he's given empirically augmented. And he then returns back two weeks later. So he's now 10 weeks post surgery, and he's still sore and he's still swollen. So he has what's termed a debridement. The Palmer approach is reopened, and he has a washout, and they grow Staphylococcus aureus and provide him with a four week course of fluoxacillin and erythromycin. He then returns back the four weeks following this course, still with a swollen wrist. So he has an ultrasound scan, which demonstrates there's still synovitis and he gets changed back to augmenting. He's referred to me and I see him now at 16 weeks post-op, having had a further two weeks of augmenting. The wrist is stiff, it's swollen, it's very sore and the patient's not very happy. So at this point, I think it's really important that we take a step back and think about what we're trying to achieve. What we're trying to achieve for this gentleman is eradication of infection and a stable wrist that's pain-free that he can function from. The most important thing we need to do is we need to accurately diagnose his infection and we need to treat that. So how do we do that? 
Well, the first thing we do, because he's well, is we stop his antibiotics and we give him an antibiotic holiday. So it's sometimes difficult to um, say to a patient, I know that you've been on antibiotics for four months, but we need to stop them. What this enables us to do is to debride and sample more accurately. So I said to him that I would take him to theatre in 10 days and that would give us a chance to get accurate diagnostic sampling and we'd be able to treat him more definitively. So I took him to theatre, I removed his scaphoid and thoroughly debrided the area. Importantly, I debrided his mid-carpal joint. So when the surgeon had gone back to do the first debridement, they'd only opened the radiocarpal joint. And because the wires are all the way through the scaphoid, they're communicating with the mid-carpal joint. So I think, I think part of the issue is that because the mid-carpal joint hadn't been debrided, they weren't able to gain control. So here are the pictures um, that we've seen before of what we did intraoperatively. And these are the operative radiographs. So when I see him, he grows MSSA from his wound. He grows staphylococcus. And he's given six weeks of oral doxycycline. And the key here is that there's no point in me seeing him at six weeks. At six weeks, when he's just finished his course of antibiotics, he's likely to be fine. So I see him at eight weeks. And this gives him two weeks for his bugs to regrow if there are any there once he stopped his antibiotics. At eight weeks, he was fine. So I operated on him at 10 weeks post his initial surgery. So what I do at his second operation is that I treat him like he's still infected. So I go back in, I resample everything, and I give him a thorough debridement and a lavage. And if macroscopically it looks clean, we'll proceed to doing a wrist fusion, which is what we did. Post-surgically, he receives broad-spectrum antibiotics until we get confirmation that none of his samples have grown any bacteria, and we can then stop them. And that's exactly what we did for him. So I think the three points to take away from this are that the first debridement is really important, and if it's done well, you're much likely to get a better outcome. Remember the mid-carpal joint. The photograph that you can see here is the head of this man's capitate. And because of the infection and because of the poor carpal mechanics, you can see how quickly the capitate head is eroded away. And importantly, I think we need to treat antibiotics with respect. We need to liaise with our microbiologists. And when we're thinking about changing antibiotics, do it with advice. My second case is a lady who in 2010 was 75 and she sustained a distal radius fracture, uh, which was plated. Um, it wasn't clear from her notes from the, or, or the hospital what happened in the interim, but in 2015, this was her next radiograph. So in the interim, she's had a wrist replacement and a distal on the head replacement. And despite having this x-ray appearance, she was asymptomatic. But unfortunately, in 2019, she developed symptoms and she had the implants removed and a debridement somewhere else. She presented to um, Oxford at the uh, end of 2019 with this wound over the ulnar aspect of her wrist. Uh, she had a vac pump on and various dressings for around three months, but the wound wasn't healing. So I took her to the theatre and we opened up her extensive compartment and all of the extensor tendons had kind of fused into one fibrotic area. And when I dissected them out and proceeded to the wrist joint, I found a lot of black substance, very bizarre looking tissues. And in the top corner, that's a cement space in which we've taken out. And after a long period of time, debriding all of that tissue away, I managed to make it look about as clean as I possibly could. And whilst I was debriding all of these tissues, I was trying to work out what it was. It didn't look like traditional metallosis. And partway through the debris model, I remembered her first radiograph. 
And what's happened is, is that in time, the pyrocarbon head of the ulnar prosthesis has been wearing on the metal of the um, radial implant. And therefore, all of that black substance was pyrocarbon deposition. And that was why she needed such a large space. It was because the uh, ulna head is quite difficult to remove. And you can see that she's had to have quite a large section of the ulna excised to get it out. When taking implants out, you can send them for something called stonication. So this is where you, um, you put them into what in essence looks like an ice cream tub, send them off to the lab, and they'll place them into a, a water bath and pass ultrasound uh, through them. And this enables the biofilm to be broken up and can also sample the area so that you can see what bacteria are being harbored on the device. Now, because she'd had an open wound for so long, she grew all of these interesting bacteria. And we started uh, a broad spectrum combination of vancomycin and ertapenem. And uh, that was then converted by the microbiologist due to some uh, side effect issues to linezapid and ciprofloxacin. And the decision had been to treat her for six weeks. It's at this point that I need Google Translate or I need a microbiologist because I'm a surgeon. I can't understand what the idiosyncrasies of all of these bacteria are. So I saw her at two weeks. And unfortunately, the ulnar wound hadn't healed. And it's at this point where I need to follow my own rules, which are, I have to take this lady back to theatre. I have to accept that I've probably not debrided this as well as I could have done. So I took her back to theatre, and there was a pocket of further pyrocarbon deposition uh, further up the ECU tendon, which I managed to excise. So this was her initial microbiology results. She now grew all of these as well. So for this, we definitely need help. So this was the treatment protocol that was um, decided on by the microbiology uh, department. We started with cotrimoxazole. Uh, we started with vancomycin and meropenem and voriconazole to treat the um, bacteria that have been grown. But then this was changed again due to side effect issues to, to cotrimoxazole and linezolid. At two weeks post-debridement, the soft tissues all healed beautifully. And because they were concerned about her medically, the, the, the linezolid was stopped and she continued on her cotrimoxazole course. This was the cement spacer that I put in. And we were due to see her in March of 2020 to do a free fibula for her. But unfortunately, the world changed. And since March of 2020, she's been living with closed wounds, but the wrist in a splint, and is reasonably happy with her functional outcome. I phone her every two to three months and make sure that she's progressing okay. And I'm due to see her in about four to six weeks in clinic for the first time in three years, just to see how she's doing. So by following the principles of managing infection, we're able to treat these patients well. And for each of these patients, all I've done is follow these principles of infection. So when we deal with complexity, if we can fall back to our principles, we're then able to apply those and manage these patients well. So thank you very much for listening, everybody. Um, my take home message is, are the first debridement is absolutely key. Um, bone infection is very, very much a surgical uh, issue. And be proactive, don't procrastinate. Ensure that you plan your surgeries well and engage with your microbiologists. They'll really help you. Thank you very much. Well, Nick, thank, thanks very much for that. That was a really, really good talk actually and incredibly enlightening. I have to say, you know, I think it sounds as though Colchester is, is, is absolutely one of those hospitals that you describe about looking at, you know, uh, initial debridement, follow up at two days for another debridement, then another one. Yeah, and and I can absolutely see um, the logic in what you're saying. That, you know, the first debridement being the the key debridement, but nevertheless, you look in the op notes, and that's that's absolutely what it looks like all the time, actually, with these repeated debridements.
Um, there are a few questions, just a couple of questions. I mean, I, like anybody else, always has anxiety about putting in metalwork in the presence of um, even well-divided infection. Um, you know, obviously there are uh, lessons that perhaps are learned from lower limb joints about sort of um, one, one stage revisions for thorough debridement and putting and then re-implanting a prosthesis. So, for, for example, that case that you showed with the, um, the um, plate fixation of a displaced fight bite, um, in, would your would your advice be, in fact, to bride it first and then to go back, or if you've done what you just you know your thorough debridement first of all um, with specimens, um, that you'd feel happy to 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 fix it at the same time as the initial debridement? So I think if that piece of bone had been removed at the first operation, it probably would have been okay. Um, I think the nature of that injury was it, it needed stability or else the long-term outcome for that patient with a metacarpal um, head split was not going to be good. So I, I think that the right decision to plate it was made at the first operation. Um, when I get to it at the second operation at two weeks, the last thing I want to be doing is to change the metal work because I'm, I'm taking a, what was a difficult fixation that's now infected and creating an even bigger problem because I've then got a difficult fixation that's already got screw holes in. So my plan for him was to, to suppress him to union. So we took really good samples and I, I took um, the, the brush that you clean your fingernails with when you scrub up, I took that and I scrubbed his plate so that I could try and remove any biofilm that was there and gave it all a very, very good wash. Uh, took the piece of bone out, filled that little cavity up with the cerement like we did for the scaphoid man um, and then from those samples I ensured that he had a, a six-week course with appropriate antibiotics so we could get him to union and then at that point I said to him well we've we've got two options now we either go in and electively take out your metal work or we give you a couple of weeks of antibiotics see how you're getting on and get you some physiotherapy and he opted for the latter and the plate stayed in for another seven eight months and the only reason he wanted the plate taking out was because he wanted to see if he could get a bit more range of motion out of the joint um but i think the, the key about suppressing to union is you've got to ensure you've got a uh, an accurate microbiological diagnosis of what you're treating because it it's much easier to manage an osteomyelitis than it is an infected non-union yeah yes Yes, right. You know, a stable infection is better than an unstable infection. Yes. I mean, it, it does seem and it's just really interesting to hear actually now from the horse's mouth of, of Oxford sort of infection specialists that I think presumably most patients you are getting referred from peripheral hospitals um, have all effectively need to learn the same lessons that you've described. It's, it's, it's usually fairly fundamental um, issues with, I suppose, the way that uh, things have been dealt with, at the, in, in, you know, at, at the referring hospital. Um, hindsight is a wonderful thing, and um, so I think there's two, it's, it's much easier for me to manage somebody else's infection than it is for me to manage my own infection, because you're, when you perform index surgery and the patient has a complication, you're emotionally um, invested into that patient, and when I have an infection, there's a feeling of guilt and causation about it. Um, and whenever you go back through the notes, whatever it is, you can always look at something and say, well, maybe if something had been done slightly differently, then we wouldn't be here. And I think, I think the thing that managing other people's infections brought into my practice is that I'm probably more assertive than I would be because, so for the lady who'd had the wrist um, replacement, I looked at her and for a split second said, well, wh why don't we see how it goes? Why don't we give her another week? And in that split second, I realized that I was just kidding myself. And actually, I just needed to bite the bullet and apologize to her and take her back to theater. Um, and I think it, it's really difficult because you, as a surgeon, you don't want to kind of believe that there is an infection from something that, from an operation that you've performed. Yes. No, and, and of course, the, the, um, um, there's the guilt of the surgeon, but also um, a patient who's having to deal with an infected problem. They would also feel, um, you know, the, 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 the um, 
to go and see somebody else, maybe in their best interest as well, because th th they don't have to deal with any feelings of grievance that they may have. Yeah. Anyway, but but listen, thank you very much for that. Just there's a, there are some questions on the chat. Um, um, first one is with regards to pulse based infections and approaches. Um, I have to say, in general, I will try and I tend to do my incision directly over where it's most prominent and most painful. I don't know what everyone else agrees, whether they do a, um, a, a mid lateral approach, but that's what I tend to do. Um, no, but, no, but this, I sometimes do a mid lateral approach, but if it's really bulging out, the whole pulp gone, then I just go straight into it, as you say. Yep. Okay. There's one about does antibiotic mix with bone cement uh, when placed after debridement have to be empirical or is it empirical as in usually gentamicin loaded or specific to culture? And actually, with reference to that as well, um, Nick, Nick, you're talking about using the cement rather than bone cement. Um, you may have mentioned as to why you tended to use that in the defect in the distal radius. And then, of course, you mentioned about sometimes you get this cement ooze. Um, is there a reason particularly, I mean, I, I, I don't, you may have mentioned it in your talk, which I, and I, if I miss it, I apologise. Ceramide presumably does not harden, does it? It, um, it hardens a little bit, but it doesn't give you the same structural support that arthroplasty cement does. So for cavities, it's great because you've managed the dead space. Um, so, so let's think about um, if the cavity and that distal radius have been infected in isolation, the traditional treatment would be to go in to put a cement spacer in and if that uh, cavity was significant to go back at six weeks and to graft it so you didn't get a secondary fracture. The benefit of the cement is that you don't then need to go back and secondarily graft it. It's a, a biphasic uh, eluting bone filler so it's got a, it's made of a combination of calcium hydroxyapatite and calcium triphosphate so the phosphate dissolves and eludes the antibiotic and leaves behind this calcium hydroxyapatite kind of scaffold that the bone can then grow through. So that's the that's the perceived benefit of the cement. Okay. It doesn't it doesn't give you enough structural support to stop the capitate collapsing towards the radius. Um, so that's why I used the cement in that particular situation. Um, when it comes to using arthroplasty cement as a spacer. Um, my advice would be if you've got previous microbiology results, then you can tailor the antibiotics that you put into the cement based on those results. But if not, I, I would go with something empirical. There's lots and lots of um, work done on how antibiotics elute from bone cement. There's lots and lots of different um, things that seem to play a role. The porosity of the cement, the surface area to volume ratio of the cement, and some antibiotics, when used in combination, um, they are loot at higher concentrations. So there's, there's lots of different things that seem to play a role in how antibiotic eluts from arthroplasty cement. OK, yeah, well, that, that's answered both of those questions. Thank you. Um, quite a good question here about when um, I'm in a unit, for example, where we don't have plastics on site. So when you debride hand infections with necrotic skin at a DGH, how do you cover the wound temporarily with tendons exposed before we can then refer onto the plastics team? Preference from dressings on tendons, et cetera. Uh, Martin, can I ask, can I, uh, do you want to have a quick talk about that one? Um, sorry, I didn't quite catch it. My microphone went off. That was the... Riding hand infections with necrotic skin. Um, obviously, I think like we, you don't have a plastics unit on site. Um, so if you don't have plastics, how do you cover the wound temporarily after debridement if tendons are exposed before referring on to the plastics team and your preference on dressing on tendons? Uh, initially, we would cover it all up in, in mephitol or cool grass, sort of um, Vaseline gauze type thing, wh whatever you've got. Um, what we were finding in Malawi is that the mephitol was, was keeping them all a bit wet and soggy. So we were moving towards inodine, which um, let them dry a bit more. Yes. And, and, and Nick, can I ask in Oxford, do you, do you um, is it sort of, a, is it um, when you've done this debridement, are you getting obviously plastic surgeons involved on day naught or day one? Um, so if I've got somebody who's referred with a soft tissue defect, the plastic surgeon will be involved. There's a plastic surgeon at every single BIU MDT meeting. So 
um, I'm lucky. Um, I think the there's a couple of questions that may get asked about vac dressings. I think vac dressings are an excellent temporary wound dressing management system. But my plastic surgeons here feel that it's not very good as a definitive solution. Um, I think the other thing to say is when in a DGH, the error isn't, I've made a big hole, the plastic surgeons are really upset with me. The error is I've not made a big enough hole and my debridement isn't good enough. So um, I don't want to give people carte blanche to go and make massive holes. Um, but my advice would be, don't compromise your debridement because you're worried about somebody else being able to cover your hole. Um, you know, you've seen the size of the ALT flap that I showed earlier. You know, plastic surgeons can cover massive defects. No, that's very, that's very good advice, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just going through back through these questions, is it possible to place the cement without a specific, the specific syringe? I mean, I have to say, I'm when I'm cementing in shoulder placements, I use any syringe, frankly, but uh, the cement comes with a specific um, inserter, does it? I think it does. It does. It, it comes with a, a, a way that you make it. So it's got, a, it's got a couple of syringes that you use to mix the, the fluid and the antibiotic all in. So it comes with its own mixing system in a similar way that arthroplasty cement does. Um, and they give, they give you a syringe uh, that you can instill it with with various lengths of nozzles so you've got more control. OK, thank you very much. Now, it's uh, 10 past three. So um, Martin Wood from Berries and Edmonds has got a few um, specific cases. It would be quite nice, actually, as well. What we could probably do is with a show of hands, you can raise your hand um, on the on the screen as to who, how many of you have of, of the delegates I've got something to show. We don't necessarily need to do an absolute count right now, but just as an, in, an interest, if, I, if the floor is open for Martin now for his cases, but if you could raise your hands, um, obviously keep on mute, and so we can get a, just a, a rough idea of who's got some cases to show. All right, the floor is yours, Martin. Hi. Um, just before I start, I'll just sort of explain how, how I've got hold of these cases. They're actually, um, none of them have I operated on, but they're all coming from the, um, the Lion Hand Unit in, in the long way in Malawi. And just in case um, any of you haven't heard about it or studied the BSSH website, which tells you a lot about it, um, the BSSH has invested in a five-year project to set up a specialist hand unit in Lilongwe, Malawi. Um, they're in the process of building a new specialist orthopedic hospital, and that we thought was a great opportunity. So since February or January, uh, there's been rotating teams of us going out there with a consultant surgeon, a trainee, and a hand therapist, uh, with a bit of overlap. So we've been helping them uh, treat the, um, the hand cases, which in the past were sort of low on their priority. We've been trying to raise their priority. And uh, I've got uh, four or five cases which sort of illustrate uh, the sort of sort of severity of infections and soft tissue injuries we see. But although they may look pretty dramatic, if you actually think of what Nick said and um, what Jonathan said before, they've all been treated exactly along the same principles um just in terms of um what um jonathan said about not leaving these too long some of the consequences are these these cases were left a little bit too long before they actually got to us 32 year old guy who um uh, came with us with a story of a human bite over the pip joint of his middle finger and this illustrates uh, exactly the point i made uh, this was several days later and it's already quite a mess Okay. So there was pus oozing out, bite marks, spreading cellulitis, and possible skin necrosis. Um, so he was started immediately on IV antibiotics, sort of broad spectrum. One of the problems in, in Malawi is we don't have quite the selection that Nick has in Oxford to play with. So basically everything they had was thrown at him. And the other problem they had out there is that it's pretty difficult to get them into theatre straight away. Although in principle, we wouldn't let the sun set on this. We had to. So it wasn't until uh, three days after the bite that he actually went to theatre. And by then, the patient was actually quite um, um, systemically unwell. So that's the Vola side of it. You can see um, the whole finger is, in, is uh, affected and it's quite deep. Um, what you often see with these, these injuries, I think it was pointed out, is that there's much more swelling on the dorsum of the hand than on the 
the volar surface. And that's just to do with the way the, the structure of the hand, how it's put together. So a debridement was started. And as you see, as exactly as Nick said, you've got to be fairly, fairly sort of thorough. And having started to open up the hand, it was found that the infection was spreading right through uh, under the tissues. It was almost it was described by the surgeon as like a necrotizing fasciitis. Um, quite clearly, there's a lot of soft tissue damage there. And by the time we looked at the, um, the finger itself, that was not viable. So it's a fairly aggressive debridement. And you can see the middle of the finger. So the whole of the um, flexor tendon sheath and the neurovascular bundles on either side were damaged and necrotic. So this finger is not viable. So it was taken off uh, as a ray amputation. Now, we, we, did a, we had to do several of these sort of ray amputations for things. And an important principle is that although the infection starts in the finger, uh, you have got to think of the deep spaces in the in the hand itself and through this this wound here you can actually get into the thinner space because the infection the incision goes right down there and into the other deep palm palmar spaces and it's important to check and release all those spaces uh, to make sure that you haven't left anything behind um, i think this was the second look uh, uh, it was actually the next day because there was theater time came up and in the setting there you take theater time when it gets to you um, so it was partially closed and the, um, the web was left to granulate over. But unfortunately, by the time they came back to clinic, the wound was beginning to break down. Uh, now, Sean, the surgeon who gave me all these cases, speculated that if he did it now, he would actually let it settle, let the whole wound settle for several days before he tried to close it. So the, the skin edges had demarcated a bit more. This did break down. This was all treated with dressings. Uh, it did gradually dry up. Um, this was uh, the last time they saw the case, or these took pictures of it. But I'm told that um, within two weeks of this, it had all epithelialized, and that wound had um, had dried up. Yeah. So, the principle of this aggressive debridement take away all the dead tissues. By the time you've taken away the dead tissues, as we've just discussed, you may have quite a big, a big hole. Uh, and then you set about um, uh, closing the, the hole. Fortunately, well, by the nature of this, there was no bone involvement because we took away the infected bone and we took away the whole finger. Um, any comments on that while, before we go into the next one? Being, being uh, I presume the, out, the outcome, I suppose, would have been different had we had you managed to get to him earlier. And it, it's obviously very tough to get into theatre, isn't it? I mean, uh, I, I know very little because of my age now about Wallant. Would this have made any? Would it have made it easier to get to theatre or to you to? Um, um, yeah, you know, possibly we have. Um, since this case, we have been doing these ray amputations under Wallant. And but the the problem in the setting in Malawi in a long way is they don't um, they, they don't um, re sort of get referred to us for two or three days. Um, this was actually a relatively quick referral. The other thing is that they come and say oh, it happened a few days ago, but you look at the finger and you're not quite sure whether you believe that or not. Um, so yeah, interesting, interesting case. You can see that. Right. Okay. So this is a is a young guy, a fifteen year old lad, and um, this actually happens more than you think. A bit of his house fell over. So um, um, the the building standards out in Malawi are not quite what we're used to, and they just put up a wall, and sometimes they fall over. So we actually saw several children out there who were damaged by uh, walls falling on them, uh, and um, in his efforts to escape, his hand got trapped. Now. This was very unclear as to exactly how old this injury was, because uh, he'd been being treated in the in a local private clinic with basically just antibiotic powder being sprinkled onto the open wounds. Eventually, at least two weeks, if not longer, he turned up in our clinic. Um, so he was taken to theatre relatively quickly, uh, within a day or so of his coming, and the whole lot debrided. And you can see this, this was the second look uh, day or so, 
and is already sort of fairly clean and um, beginning to sort of granulate. Um, that was 48 hours after the initial surgery. But as you see, there's quite a large hole there. there. Now, fortunately, the way we've set up the Lion project is that we have a, a WhatsApp MDT system and we can call on the expertise of plastic surgeons back in the UK. And uh, every couple of weeks, there's a sort of live uh, meeting where we can discuss cases. And uh, you, we get a lot of um, suggestions of what to do. Um, so the, the suggestions of this was to put a full thickness graft on it, a groin flap or a radial forearm flap. Uh, and Sean, Sean Walsh, the surgeon there, He's um, familiar with the radial forearm flap, so that's what he elected to do. So you can see they've taken the paddle from here, moved it um, through, through here, it's pinned it around, and this is the, the paddle of skin from there. Um, that's it being inset. Uh, that's the first um, dressing change five, uh, five days after the initial thing. And then this is eight days. You can see the whole thing is viable and um, uh, settling in nicely. So I think at that stage, the patient was discharged home. I came back to regular intervals under the care of the hand therapists. And uh, that's the donor site, which was covered by a split skin graft from his thigh, his thigh there. That gave him quite a good function. Sort of comments or questions about that, that, that case has been good um you know and i suppose what you're exhibiting there is all the principles um that nick was alluding to in terms of quick treatment you know really thorough debridement that looked extremely clean didn't it um after that first debridement and then um you know uh, vascularized skin cover um um yeah you know i think it it's it, i suppose it demonstrates the importance of having a joint sort of ortho, ortho and plastic sort of approach it's very much so these are very much soft tissue in injuries, soft tissue infections that we're, we're dealing with. And it's, it's really useful that we have um, plastics expertise um, to call upon. Um, most of the time, uh, up to now in the last six months, we've managed to have an orthopedic surgeon and a plastics trainee or vice versa at the same time out there. And that's a, a really good combination. So this is um, another typical infection, been left for a little bit long. So this was a farmer, a 60 year old farmer who caught his finger in the fields uh, six weeks previously, six weeks is being a sort of just average time. Um, and it gradually swelled up, He'd been sort of treating it with um, local remedies, basically essentially wrapping it up and doing nothing about it. Um, I don't know if you can see that. No, I can't make it bigger. Um, Anyway, the, the x-ray was quite dramatic. Uh, there was so much bone loss and swelling there that we did consider whether this was a tumour or not, but the history was of infection. And as soon as we admitted him, we, he did go on antibiotics and the soft tissue elements did start to settle down. Um, so anyway, he underwent um, a similar sort of procedure to the, one of the other cases, uh, a radical uh, um, amputation, re-amputation, with it, uh, debridement right down into the hand itself, make sure this whole area was clean. You can see how far proximally you have to take the, um, I mean, if you go, do a good ray amputation, you should go fairly far proximally. But in terms of these infections, it's really useful to open the entire hand up to um, make sure you've, you've cleaned it out. And then what you're left with is relatively clean. Um, as I say, we've done quite a few of these ray amputations. Some of them you can just leave to um, granulate over and some of them we put a little full thickness skin graft in here after after a week or so um, so now in terms of antibiotics um, initially we had a problem patients don't come back for follow-up um, and we can't keep them on the wards forever um, we did start um, Interestingly, from what Nick was saying, we did start just giving them all a course of anti of oral antibiotics. Say, go home with this and please come back. Some of them did, some of them didn't. So this guy had um, two weeks of antibiotics. Uh, we never saw him again. Um, so we presumably um, he did heal up. Another interesting thing, a little technical point. I'm not sure whether you can see um, these wounds. We've also taken to stitching them up with monocryl. 
uh, on the basis that if they don't come back, then the monocle will eventually fall out and we won't have to take the stitches out. This is a the thing I was um, actually this is one of a, a case probably from about 10 years ago, um, uh, a case actually when I was able to tell the um, intensive care unit staff at Colchester what I thought was wrong with her. So this was a lady in her 80s admitted um, initially to the war to um, go to the hospital must have been about 10 plus years ago, uh, very unwell and got gradually more and more unwell. Um, um, uh, I think effectively they couldn't quite work out what the diagnosis was. Nothing was really showing up in blood cultures, but she was using very low. Um, she had this funny lesion on her finger. So um, I, they asked us to have a look um, as orthopedic surgeons, and I suggested that it might be a herpetic infection in her finger. Um, unfortunately, so that information um, was filtered up. Um, they, um, uh, I think, did start actually on some acyclovir. They took some specimens from that. But actually, overnight, this poor lady died from a herp herpes encephalitis. So I think I'm only really showing this as um, sometimes you get a, um, um, you know, something something that appears in a hand that actually can um, uh, um, be a more systemic problem. Um, um, and I have to, I've not seen a hepatic finger before or since, I have to say. I wonder if anyone else has seen anything like this before. The nearest I've seen is a malignant schwannoma that looked a bit like that, and the patient died of that not quite right. so quickly. But that was the first presentation. This is a 28-year-old man. Um, in a way, this looks like a, a sort of less of a problem than some of the previous pictures, but um, the same principles. There's an old injury. This was a bite, and there's spreading infection right into the thinner space here. Okay. Um, so he was um, allegedly bitten about a week before he presented. So he was taken to theater relatively quickly. And um, you can see it's, it is already, on a presentation, a pretty widespread infection. Um, and then it was debrided. And as, as Nick said, once you keep debriding things, you can end up with, it's not, a, it's not a big hole because it's only one thumb, but there's quite a lot of the thumb missing by now. Um, so this was the flex extended sheath. And I'll, there is, I think there's one neurovascular bundle there. And so they felt the thumb itself was viable, but um, it clearly needs something done to cover it. Um, so again, we went through the MDT process. There were a lot of um, uh, suggestions of, of little flaps and things. Um, now, interestingly, this guy was sitting on the board having dressings while, these, um, while this was going on. And he spoke, he was talking to some of the other people who had had groin flaps and big things like that. And he, he basically, I think they'd frightened him. So they wouldn't really let us do it. He wouldn't let us do much to him. So we just ended up letting it all granulate. And it granulated mostly, apart from a little bit there. So the most he'd let us do is put a skin graft on him. Um, you can see it's cleaning up. And this is, a, is another principle. Even once you've done your debridement, you're back to normal tissues. Um, some of the patients went away or sat on the ward, and it was several days before we got back to them again and got them back to the theatre. And they looked all horrible. They looked like they'd sort of completely passed out again. But once we had encouraged the nurses to not to ignore these, not to just wrap them up and ignore them, but to keep cleaning them regularly, then we actually realized that the wounds were healing underneath and all the pus and horribleness that we thought was just exudate on the top. And the, the importance of regular dressing changes and, and cleaning them and keeping them clean on the wards uh, became rapidly sort of clear to us. So this guy did end up with a split skin graft, uh, which mostly took, that's a better view. And again, with dressings in the, in the clinic, debriding some of the crusty stuff off it. These skin grafts do actually do quite well. And he went on to, to have, get complete soft tissue cover. And um, at the um, last time he was seen, he was had a bit of a stiff thumb, but he had actually a functional hand. So we regarded that as success. Excellent. Thank, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Um, 
Well, I don't think there are any other talks, so I thought it might be quite useful just to have a few um, slides to look at um, um, splintage after this, because at the end of the day, um, you can do all the surgery you want um, and um, effectively save somebody's hand in terms of getting the soft tissue, soft tissue to recover. But if it's not, uh, if the rehab um, and the therapy post-surgery um, is inadequate, um, you will um, reduce the chance of a, a good functional outcome. So um, Deb Stanton, who is one of the hand therapists at Colchester, has got uh, just a few slides to show um, um, we need really to discuss some of the rehab um, that that can be um, uh, applied. Okay. Um, Perfect. So I think really we'll just give a few minutes just to talk about the role of your hand therapist or your physiotherapist or your therapy technician, because I know that the types of therapists are very different um, all over the world. And just to quickly talk about the aims of hand therapy. With all of these cases that you've been talking about, which has been really interesting, I think in terms of hand therapy, our aim is really to prevent the complications associated with the edema that always develops after these cases, um, and then to restore range of motion and then to help restore function. And edema management is the same everywhere. Um, whether everybody has access to everything that is needed is not necessarily the case, but um, obviously rest, everybody can rest. Um, everyone can apply some compression and of course, elevation, elevation, elevation. Ice obviously will depend on the wound, whether it's appropriate and whether it's available. And that's something that the therapist will always hopefully talk to their hand surgeon about. So in terms of splinting for edema, what we're trying to make sure is that all the tissues that are supposed to remain nice and long and allow good joint range of motion are held in such a position that they don't shorten. And those that we don't mind them being a little bit shorter um, are, are kept in that position, but obviously we want to keep as much long as it should be. So you can see on the bottom two pictures, um, this is the ideal position after um, a, a hand surgery of any sort, really, if you're if you're a bit stuck and not quite sure what to do with them when you're in theatre. So the position of safe mobilisation. Um, the principle being that the IPJs and MCPs must be rest, rested with the ligaments taut. Um, these are not new principles for any of you, but I think these lovely drawings um, demonstrate really clearly what happens to the ligaments during um, extension at the MCPs. You know, the ligaments are, are, are slack, whereas if you flex them nicely, they're all taut, so they can't shorten and tighten, and you end up with stiff MCPJs, and obviously the opposite way around for your um, PIPJs. In terms of edema management, um, elevation, elevation. This is actually a video, but I don't think it'll play unfortunately but it's just the use of a, a pillowcase um, or you could use a, a sarong or um, a kakoi or anything that you have um, just to and a bit of tape or a bit of um, safety pins just to create a sling and then you can use a, a coat hook or a drip stand or anything that is available in your in your hospital um, and we try to give out leaflets with the the pictures on you know position of the heart and the um the mantra of try and keep the hand above the heart. That's your pump. One's your pump. One's your fluid level, and you want to keep the fluid level above your your pump. Um, if you don't have um, any of the, the the compression bandages that that we might have here, the ones that are self adhesive, just normal bandage compression is very helpful it's easy to do and this particular way of using bandage compression does not create stiffness you can create a full fist with this and it's something that you know um, if you can bandage up after an operation and do this and then get the patients moving afterwards safely with your tissue cover this is the best way to bandage them to control um, edema around the mcps 
the PIPs and help prevent some of that stiffness that is associated with all those horrible proteins that 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 come with your um, excessive edema after injury and infection. Um, we get them moving as quickly as allowed. Um, and why why is it so important? Well, obviously we want um, edema reabsorption. Um, we want to try and make sure that your scar tissue um, forms with all your fibrin and collagen all nicely aligned and not all just a big mishmash of nasty scar tissue, which doesn't allow movement. Um, we want to try and stop those little connections between different layers of tissue. As we know, scar tissue will stick anything to anything. So trying to get things moving and prevent that happening um, is important. And uh, movement, we know, promotes the um, collagen elasticity as it's laid down. So anything that is safe to move should be moved as soon as possible. And in cases particularly like the last one Martin showed us with the, um, the radial forearm flap, we mustn't forget the elbow and we mustn't forget the shoulder. Keep all of those things going, particularly in your perhaps more elderly patients if they're being looked after um, or perhaps even mollycoddled and um, they uh, perhaps wouldn't be using their arm at all. Um, and that's when those patients get those nasty tight elbows and shoulders. So I'm not quite sure why this picture is in the middle. I apologize about that. Um, protect what we know is stable um, with whichever way you can, whether you're using plaster of Paris or you've got access to splinting materials. and um, start the motion. So this motion actually is really more appropriate for fractures, um, but just to quickly go through the kind of the, 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 tri the triangle of motion, remember there's lots of different types that you can teach your patients. They can move passively, um, they can move actively, but with a bit of help from the other hand, um, they can use unresisted active movement um, and they can use resisted movement. Um, and whether you want that motion to be active in both directions, if they've got tendon involvement or just passive, um, is entirely up to what's happened. Depends on, on the surgery, obviously. Um, question is whether you want just one joint moving. Um, are you trying to prevent movement some joint because you're waiting for a flap? Um, and therefore, can you get the, the joint, the move, the um, joints on either side moving to try and facilitate some tendon guiding? Um, so looking at all of those things, very important um, to make sure that everything adjacent moves so that all the underlying tissue can perhaps glide. Um, important to tell people how often, uh, a little bit, very often is much more beneficial than saving it all till the end of the day and trying to get things going. Um, always being mindful of whether there's been any fracture stabilization or as um, looking back at Nick's talk earlier, whether you've got um, some metal work bridging um, always speak to your hand therapists about what what you feel is stable and what can be done. And I'm sure they'll all be very happy to to follow your instructions. Different ways of tendon gliding, obviously. Um, you can use one finger, you could use all the fingers. And uh, the bottom picture is uh, the best way to get your extensors um, gliding nicely underneath your um, any kind of flap that you might have on the back of the hand. Um, this is just a nice, a nice sequence of tendon gliding. So the first one, obviously you're getting FDS and FDP working together. I mean, the second one, sorry, the third one, you're obviously just getting, um, FDS to work. And then the fourth one, you've got everything pulling in there. So you're getting the layers of tendons gliding past each other. Um, this is a great exercise, um, with a pencil, it's supposed to be a video. That's again, apologies for not working, but but getting a pencil and walking up the hand and down the hand um, helps all those tendons to get loose. If the hand is feeling a bit stiff afterwards, you can do it with a, all the fingers at once, or you can just walk the pencil up and walk the pencil down. Um, and I, th I think that's all I have for you today. I hope that there's a few hints in there to help be very happy to answer any questions. Okay, um, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Debs. Um, well, look, I mean, um, I just got one little, think... little thing, uh, 
the results of therapy. If I can just show you this. There you are. That's that flap that we mentioned after a few weeks of therapy. So we're really lucky to have therapists with us in. There you go. Impressive. How old was that patient, Martin? That patient, um, he was 28. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm very grateful for your attendance. Um, I think there were some really, I thought some fantastic talks, actually. I thought, um, Nick, yours was, was, was an extremely interesting talk, um, you know, really drawing on, on basic principles. And, and when things look like they are um, unbelievably complex, just dividing into sort of separate little sections, Dealing, each, dealing with each one um, as a small as a small part of the problem, I think is certainly you know being organised about it, doing it in the right order. Clearly, is the is, is the is the way to do it, and I think that's a lesson for everyone, all of us here. So, thank you very much for that great talk. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining us, everyone. I can't see any more questions here either, so I'm actually going to draw the meeting to a close now. But thanks very much.